Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Alcor Devs number 134. Um, a couple of things on the agenda today. I think by far the biggest one is um, Kiln and, and kind of going through what, what happened, um, making sure we, we figure out uh, next steps from here. Um, then uh, we have some updates on uh, some Shanghai proposals. So um, uh, Alex has some updates on, on, on Beacon Chain withdrawals. There's also someone else, uh, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on their name, uh, who, who left a comment and wanted to discuss something about partial withdrawals. Um, and then uh, their proto had a bunch of updates about uh, EIP 4844. And then if we still have time uh, at the end, I uh, I had a, a proposal about um, how we can har harmonize uh, the core EIP process and the executable specs uh, that are being worked on. Um, so to kick us off, um, yeah, Perry, I'll, I'll, I'll point to you, but maybe some somebody else in a better position, but does someone kind of want to walk through high level what happened through the Kiln merge? Um, and then we can probably hear from like the different client teams kind of specifically about what, what went down on, on their side. Sure, um, I can give a high level overview. So we had the Kiln testnet launch last, uh, the proof of work portion of it launched last week on Wednesday. And we had the proof of stake beacon chain launch last week on Friday. The merge itself happened on Tuesday, a bit earlier than expected. Um, we had to delay the merge once by using the terminal override, uh, terminal total difficulty override flag. And that was unexpected, but that exercise seemed to have worked perfectly. All the clients respected it and we noticed no, no weird behavior from anyone. However, once the merge, act, merge transition actually happened, a few clients did have issues with block proposal and or syncing. Um, I'll let the individual client teams go into detail later on. Um, since then, the network seems stable. I think there are still one or two clients that have some issues, um, but they, they all seem to be minor and should be fixed relatively soon. Got it, thanks. Um, one thing, uh, I'm curious about the status of, as well as the, the block explorers. I know there were some issues uh, with the block explorers like shortly around the merge and, and they kind of uh, were, we're lagging for, for a while. Um, can you just give us a quick update if you know yeah. what, what had in there? Yeah, um, so we, we run a forked version of the Beacon Chain Block Explorer and one of the payloads, exactly the execution payload was set to int instead of big int. Um, this wasn't an issue in the previous ones because, well, the base fee per gas didn't, wasn't too high, um, but apparently in this one, or the number of transactions weren't too high. And in this one, it was high, so it just overflowed. Um, I think it's pretty much the same thing that tripped up Prism that tripped up the Explorer, but it's fixed now and the Explorer just takes a long time to sync. So I think we're still stuck about, uh, we're lagging by a day or something. Okay, great. Uh, apologies to everyone on the live stream. There was a, a OBS issue and only my voice was audible. So I'll recap what Perry said in 30 seconds. Um, and uh, we, we also have the Zoom transcript, which we can we can add to the notes to get the full version. Um, but basically with Kiln launched under proof of work last Wednesday, uh, the proof of stake beacon chain went live last Friday. Uh, we there was too much mining on the network. Uh, so we had to use the TTD override feature in clients, which, which worked well and allowed us to delay the actual merge on the network, which still happened Tuesday. Um, there were a couple issues on the merge around block production and syncing, and, and we'll dive into uh, in, into uh, the specific ones from, from clients right after, uh, but the network was still, was still uh, finalizing and, and is still doing so today. And there, there were some issues also with the block explorers, uh, some integer overflow issues and, um, these have been fixed, uh, but the block explorers are still lagging, uh, importing all the data. Um, anyone else have just like general comments on Kiln before we, we kind of dive into the, the, the specific client issues? Okay. Um, oh, 
Go ahead. Will we be, discuss will we be discussing perhaps after the, the client issues whether we want to do another dev test net before public test nets given that failure or not? Yes, I think actually we uh, we might we can maybe do that now. Like uh, I know yeah. Maris, Perry, and I and, and others have talked about uh, shadow forking Gordy next week, basically. Um, so I I think yeah, the I, short answer is yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think given the um, given that kiln, at least as we believe the specs will be, is feature complete, and we've kind of solicited a lot of the community to jump in on it. Um, I'd like to just kind of keep that as quote, the public test net right now and continue to ask people to do full, you know, application deploys and things like that. Um, I would say certainly we should do um, another uh, test net, you know, call another transition um, and, and maybe that just call it a dev net um, and ha it have an end of life. And I'd also, I'm an advocate for, um, you know, shadow forking Gorley and or Spolia every few days for the next few months. Um, you know, if we can if we can automate that in a way that kind of just shows us the latest builds continue to work and, and block production is happening and all that kind of stuff, that's gonna, I think, allay a lot of the concerns. Right, and yeah, I, I, I feel I'll be more confident in this in about five, 10 minutes, but um, as I understand it right now, none of the issues we found on Kiln are like spec issues. They all seem to be client implementation issues so to me that says like you know we, we don't need like a different public testnet uh, which runs like an updated version of, of the merge specs we need as i understand it like clients to obviously fix fix the issues that they found um and and we obviously want to test that on on devnets um but yeah unless i think there's like a, a significant change to the spec it seems like we can just keep killing as is and obviously have clients issue new releases, which, which we'll, we'll work on the network. Um, and then there's a question in the chat about MEV boost. I don't think it's being used uh, yet, no. And we've reached out uh, to the Flashbots teams this week to, to chat with them about that. Um, cool, I guess, yeah, to, to dive into the client stuff a bit more, uh, I'll start with the, I don't know, First one that comes to mind was that there was a prism guess uh, kind of incompatibility around uh, the encoding of, of values like the base sheet. Uh, I don't know if anyone from prism is on. Uh, I'm here. Terrence. Yes. Yeah. Terrence, do you want to give us a quick, quick overview of what, what happened? Yeah. Sounds great. Thanks for having me here. So um, high level summary, um, execution layer uses big Indian, consensus layer uses little India. So when we, um, we have this costume um, implementation for protobuf, so whenever we marshal and, uh, and the, our marshal specific data field, we have to be careful to basically reverse the bytecode. And we miss that for the base fee per guest field. And unfortunately, um, we didn't catch that for the previous test net because, um, because the base fee per guest was quite low and there wasn't, Actually, people are reporting only the videos are broken. So should we fix that first? Or uh, so we are. Sorry, can you say something? Yeah. Uh, in the chat, people are saying the audio. Yeah. Is okay. broken. So. Yeah. I don't know. Sorry. Yeah, everything's turned on. I'll just I'll upload the Zoom recording after. Uh, okay, sounds good. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna keep going then. So yeah, basically the previous test net was unable to catch that because the base view per guess was quite low. So yeah, I'm happy to, um, I'm happy to, yeah, I was quite happy to, to realize this bug. So as the corrective action, I posted a um, post-mortem on Twitter. I'm sure most of y'all have seen it, but um, high, high level summary for that is that we will be, of our testing infrastructure. So right now we are working on our differential buzzer for all the API endpoint, meaning that we will uh, aiming to be 100% compliant with all the module and our module. And for our end-to-end -end testing, we are also adding um, the transaction generator 
And uh, so we can make sure to send all the exotic transactions to make sure the B3 per gas uh, does not remain low and stuff. So yeah, that's the high level summary. Thanks. Um, and we're, Marius, I understand there was no issue on the get side, right? It was just the get prism combination, but like get was working, right? Is that, is that correct? Yes. And like the, we, we, we saw this bug because uh, get prism didn't, uh, didn't create any blocks. And uh, we only noticed it because uh, gas prism is such a large majority of the network, and that's why we only saw gas prism. But it it's probably it was probably also on gas, uh, or it, it was also on gas uh, visu and uh, gas in other mind. So it has nothing to do with gas. Got it. Got Sorry. it. Prism yeah. visu prism other mind. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. Okay, thanks. Thanks for sharing. Any any questions from people on that? Yeah, I guess in not just the Prism CI, we need to make sure that we have sufficient transaction activity in you know Kurtosis nightly builds and some of the other testing uh, we have as well. Yeah. Also, Yo, I will say I was looking at the base fee on Gorley, um, and I don't believe it's always above two fifty five. So um, we might consider when we do Shadow Fork to make sure that there's sufficient activity on there as well. Yes, Marius, would your transaction fuzzer work on Gorley if you have enough ETH? Sure, sure. Okay. Unfortunately, someone stole all of my Gorley ETH. So uh, okay, create a new state address. It, I'll if you send could you send one. it back, <laughs> if you're listening to to this call and you you send it back, then uh, I can I can test. <laughs> so uh, one one thing that I, like one thing that I wanted to talk about was uh, that I think we lacked insights a bit into uh, which clients were like. Uh, missing the slots and uh, which clients were were like uh, not proposing blocks or not attesting and um, I think we we need to up our game there a bit so that we can like uh, see the bad client the odd one out way quicker than we than we did just uh, on 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 Tuesday. Yes, agreed. I know there was an idea. Um, I think it was Perry's idea of like maybe we build um, like dev nets, which have each combination of client as like a super majority client, so that if we there's issues that show up, kind of they they show up uh, and the network stops finalizing. Um, but I don't know if that would catch um, if, if that would catch the bulk of it. Is that is that a suggestion for the nightly builds, Perry? Yeah, exactly. So one variation of the nightly build is just to have all clients together. And the second variation is to just have a combination of every client as a super majority. Um, and we could just do this parallelly nightly. So if a super majority client fails, it's a lot louder. Whereas if, if it's just a minority client, we might not even notice an issue. Yeah, I mean, if that's a tractable thing to do at this point, I would say yeah, definitely. <laughs> Anything like that that we can do to kind of continuously get a, a view into things working is really good at this point. I was going to say for the Bitcoin Block Explorer, you can tie the proposer into like a name. So if we look at if we look at a printer, for example, if you see the proposer, it actually says Prism, uh, White House, blah blah blah. So we probably can do that for Kiln as well. Yeah, I'll look into that one as well. Um, and one other nice thing that Jim um, from Attestant Vouch worked on updating ETH2. So you can now process a block or an epoch as soon as it comes out and it'll list out all the proposer indexes that have failed or missing attestations or sync committee participation. So we no longer have to wait for the Explorer to update. The Explorer will always be a bit slower uh, but since this tool isn't actively indexing, you have to call it. It'll be a lot faster and should be easier to debug stuff.
Nice. Um, I think there were also some issues on on Kiln between Besu and Teku, if if that's right. Uh, yeah. Does anyone from either team want want, want to give an, an update? Yeah, I can uh, I can speak to that. There is a uh, a case that we weren't expecting where uh, the terminal block was finalized, and uh, our logic to to check that we were descending from a, a valid terminal block wasn't considering that the block itself that was being finalized was the terminal block. So there were some cases where uh, basically we just sit sit there at, at TTD. Um, so you know, we've got that, uh, we've got a PR for that. And uh, also we had some issues with uh, backward sync, which we have a matching backward sync PR that is <clears throat> merging today. So we should have uh, 22.1.3 snapshot, which is what we are gonna recommend for using for a kiln. Um, but yeah, that's the issue that we were having and, and encountered. And there was a couple of reports of, of Basu sitting at TTD for that reason. Got it. And so the fact that it was Basu Teku was, there was nothing on the Teku end, right? It was, it was just a coincidence on yeah, the other side. Correct. Okay. Got it. Yes. Cool. Um, and then I think Nethermind also had, had an issue or, or two. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, so the issue for Nethermind was that uh, some nodes after the transition uh, require a restart to make it work. So after the restart, uh, they are working fine. Uh, we are still investigating it and uh, to make sure that it was fixed, we need to experiment a bit with transition. Uh, we found a few potential places, but it's still uh, investigated. Uh, one good news uh, is that Marius run differential father between Geth and Nethermind. Uh, so father is sending random requests to execution clients and comparing heads and seems that both clients behave in the same way. Awesome. And I know Aragon as well. I think you, you, uh, you knew that Aragon would probably have some issues during the transition, but still ran it anyway. You want to give a quick update on like, yeah, what, what you learned from this and, and, and where you're at right now? So uh, there was one issue in Aragon um, actually related to Indian as, as well uh, that was fixed. Uh, but uh, so we were incorrectly sending invalid block hash uh, for a valid block. But I think uh, Teco was uh, incorrectly ignoring our incorrect invalid block hash. And it was keeping, like resending the same block, um, though we sent invalid block hash. Uh, also, because Aragon um, was quite late to the party, um, I personally would like more time. To, we are still uh, refactoring our sync, sync code, uh, and um, given that Kiln, we, like uh, quite a few issues uh, we are discovered uh, during Kiln, though maybe not like theoretically blocking, but still uh, I, I would suggest not to rush the merge. Uh, take take it slowly. Spend more time on testing, more like merge transitions and things like that. Uh, yeah, and uh, I personally would like to spend more time understanding how sync uh, works on the consensus layer side, uh, the difference between optimistic, non-optimistic sync, um, performance uh, implications, uh, think about it, test, because I'm worried like what we were discussing in the chat really recently is that what are kind of the performance uh, implications of uh, like consensus layer sending us when you have to sync something and then consensus layer sends a, a block, uh, block every, every block to the execution layer is it okay is it not okay maybe it is okay but uh, i personally would like to spend some more time thinking about it and, and also testing it right um yeah thanks thanks for sharing are there other client teams, I think those were all the ones that kind of had issues um, on on Kiln specifically. But did I did I miss anyone? Okay, 
I guess not. Um, and so I guess, yes. Yeah, so in, in terms of next steps from here, like obviously I think it's, it's clear to, to everyone that like we need more testing infrastructure and, and things like, like running uh, shadow forks of Gordy and, and, and rerunning through the transition uh, uh, a couple more times. Um, I think in terms of like, you know, rushing the merge or not and, and, and timelines, um, we, we probably have another month or so before we need to make a call about whether we want to move to test nuts or whether, uh, uh, you know, whether we're, we're not ready for that. Um, so I, I, don't, I, I feel like that the next step is probably to spend obviously the, the next two weeks and then possibly the next four weeks um, improving the testing infrastructure, finding these, 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 these issues um, and, and, you know, growing confidence in our, in our implementations. And then we can probably make a call about, you know, do we feel comfortable moving this through the test nets or, or not? And, um, and if not, then I think at that point, it's like we, we might have to, to, to discuss potentially pushing back the difficulty bomb. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do think we probably still have like one month basically until, until we, we have to make that call. Um, at a high level, I think that the bomb is going to start being, uh, you know, noticed uh, early June, around mid June, mid June to mid July. We probably have like 14, 15 second block times, which is high but not unmanageable. And late July, early August, assuming like things are the same, you probably are looking at like 17 or, or more, and that starts to be you know much much greater delays. Um, and just considering the time it takes to generally go from test nets to mainnet. Um, yeah, I, I think we, we basically have like about a month where where, where we can kind of grow our, our confidence in, in these implementations and, and then have to make a call. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, the, the more iteration cycles we get of testing of, of shadow forking in that period, uh, the better. Um, and um, So one, yeah. one, like one thing that I'm, that I'm thinking about is like, I don't think we, we like I think we uncover a lot of bugs, and um, but we don't like we don't really notice them. We don't really recognize them. So um, like there was uh, this uh, 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 sync aggregation attestation thingy, whatever. Where like that that there was like at at like sixty percent or something, and then uh, after two weeks. Uh, Someone decided to look into it, and it, it turned out that Nethermind was uh, Prism was just not sending sending some something, and I think that is like that is the bigger issue. Like I think we we, we do uh, trigger a lot of bugs, and I'm I'm pretty sure that we triggered the the Prism um, uh, the Prism uh, base fee uh, uh, encoding bug at least five times already uh, but we but we never recognized it as, as such so I think we should spend more time uh, building infrastructure to recognize these bugs and I would like really urge um, all the client teams that if they see something funny on or something interesting on all uh, on, on a test net or, or wherever then they should reach out to the clients that they think are affected and then and uh, like uh, really look into it instead of just saying okay that was that was pretty funny but uh, if i restart my client then it's away so it's like a non issue and uh, i think we do that way too often i think we could probably come up with <clears throat> something like key uh, 10 10 or so key indicators that a, that a, a test net's healthy right um, and it's not, it's not just finality. Finality is good. Uh, you know, that's what you hope to see always on mainnet, even if there's some sort of issue with a client here or there. Uh, but there's other things like it, no one's looking at the, the sync aggregate thing because no one's really running uh, <clears throat> light clients. And so it doesn't really matter and just kind of falls into the wayside. But that's an indicator that something's not right, right? So there's that. There's the number of blocks per epoch. It should be 32 almost all the time. There's the number, you know, there's the, the, the finality. There's um, you know, the, the amount of, the percentage of attestations actually making it on, et cetera. And so I would say most of our, most of our monitoring and most of our 
kind of like integration testing should be looking at a number of these things rather than just um, finality, which I think we rely a, a bit too much on the two thirds metric there, which obviously can let a lot of error through. I think we should also uh, think more about test cases for Hive because Mario Viga is doing great work with uh, this test. And uh, I think we should all uh, try to add more test cases here. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm definitely of the mind that at this point, if there's one or a half resource from each team that can work on testing DevOps and other things that we would be in a much better place come four weeks from now. Yes, agreed. And I know that, um, I don't think he's on the call, but Frederick from the EF has been trying to gather uh, people from different teams to, to, to coordinate all of that. So um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully like we, we can just, have more people from each team, but also kind of be a bit more proactive in sharing the stuff that's being worked on so that everybody's aware of what everybody else is, is, is working on. Oh, Frederick is here. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, I've, <laughs> I've, sent, I've sent that out. Um, so, uh, and I've sent a message to the client teams as well about it. So hopefully that will get moving. Thanks. And um, maybe just to touch back on, on, on one thing that uh, Andrew brought up, the, uh, the thing around like syncing and, and bulk sending uh, the blocks at the execution layer. I'm curious, Jake, generally how people feel about that. Like, is that something that can realistically be, be changed before the merge? Is that something that like we might want to improve shortly after? Um, so it, it's something that can be leveraged, like the, the execution layer can already leverage the information to whatever it wants here. The, <clears throat> the consensus layer, if it's syncing and sending you bulk blocks means that it is not at the head and it literally doesn't have a good piece of information for you to, to decide how to like do reverse sync and any sophisticated methods from the head. And so it's walking its way forward. Uh, and that's, that's just the case. And so you can either execute as it does that, or because you know the current time in the world, you know that uh, the consensus layer is not quite actually at the head. Um, you can wait until the consensus layer gets to the head and then do whatever sync techniques that you like to do at that point. Um, but th it, there's kind of a, uh, a bit of a chicken egg problem here. You can, you can lockstep sync with them or you can wait until they get to the head and then do whatever sync method you want. Um, and there's, an, there's sufficient information to be able to make either of those decisions. That makes sense. Does anyone have I'm any- I'm happy to, oh, to talk yeah, about that ahead. more in some of the channels and stuff, uh, if people want to discuss different design decisions. Sweet, yeah, I think, yeah, it's been discussed a, a bunch, so we can, we can keep kind of the, the conversation there. Um, was there anything else that people wanted to discuss about Kiln or the merge or just like testing specifically? I would like to quickly discuss safe, uh, unsafe, and finalized oh. tags. Um, so, uh, yeah, there is a PR uh, opened into the execution APIs repo that just adds finalized uh, block tag uh, to the uh, Ethereum JSON RPC. Um, uh, and uh, on the last call, we roughly decided not to have safe or uh, was a bit uncertain about that. And uh, one of the suggestions uh, one of the one of the things that we may do for safe block tag is to um, uh, um, is to use justified justified block for it as a stop gap until we get a safe rule um, implemented um, like 
in, in its like full proposal that's made by Demcrat and Aditya. Um, so this uh, using justified block is pretty cheap from CL standpoint. So it's just responding with, just sending these justified block hash to, to EL. And uh, it also um, brings a safe block closer to uh, the head than the finalized one. And it's a truly safe block. It's not going to be reorged, uh, assuming uh, that there is the honest majority and the synchronicity. Um, also, yeah, but yeah, it's it's still uh, not that close to the head, um, like as we previously discussed, as safe um, could be. So that's just the proposal and just curious what people do think about it. I think that's good. I think that 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 is the block that we that we should declare as safe. And uh, yeah, I think it, it's nice too because it gives uh, the exchanges and stuff a chance to begin using this, and the algorithm can improve. Don't good. Are you are you here? Can you chime in on what, how you feel about justified being the safe currently? I mean, there's definitely no downside to using that for now, I think. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, as an update on that, it's, there's like, it's unfortunately turned out that it is much harder than we thought to define a safe head with LMD. Uh, so, yeah, um, uh, I, I'm still, uh, optimistic that we can do it but uh, but yeah it's definitely a good idea to have this intermediate solution i would say there's no downside the downside is that we can't point latest at that because it's too far behind which is yeah, contentious right. yeah yeah sure sure it's, it's of course but it's it's safe right that justified so like yeah. in the in the safe at sort of framework the justified one is definitely safe Do we, is, yeah, there a reason, I think a is there a reason we don't have a justified tag? Like if that's, is that a useful thing beyond the safe tag? Like, can we imagine execution or people talking to the RPC wanting to know the justified it, block? It, it might, it might be. Uh, if we had <clears throat> safe, justified and finalized where safe and justified are just kind of equivalent at this point, that does give an additional granularity of uh, <clears throat> progressive confirmation in a sense um you know not finalized but now the assumption on this break this changing is much higher than just safe um but you're also kind of just giving users more choice which may or may not be good so yeah I like I, i'm the... not opposed to exposing justified it, 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 you can definitely think of use cases where it's nice I feel like if, if there's use cases, then exposing it seems like the right thing to do. And we can always just in the docs make it clear that hey, you should probably just use safe. If you if you don't if you don't know what you're doing, use safe. But we also offer justified and finalized or whatever. I think like I feel like we can solve the problem yeah, of that's... too many choices via good documentation. My only issue with that is once we have uh, uh, safe and justified and different things, then like safe is less safe than justified. I think that's, that's really weird. It's already it's already weird that yeah. safe is less safe than yeah. finalized. Uh, but it's, it's it sounds like you're being swallowed gross, yeah. by a storm. Yeah. You, you told me uh, I could. You told me I could go for a walk. During, but we uh, took. We got the point. We got the point. The semantics <laughs> of like safe versus finalized and justified is weird. That safe is less safe than those two things. Um, uh, we could just call it unsafe. Uh, <laughs> I would no. I would not say that it's like less safe. It's it's safe under They're finalized safe, and safe. Yeah, I, I mean finalized, justified, and safe. All, all, all three are safe under different assumptions. That's how it safe should be one, better. Safe two, safe three. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, 
I'm, I'm open to uh, other terms for the safe if people have them. Um, I'm also fine with safe. Confirmed is a good alternative, but it doesn't convey the same meaning. I think confirmed is very dangerous because it has the proof of work connotation. And so people might confuse that with uh, like literally finalized. Or the last, when is a block confirmed six times? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> some, yeah, something like agree. that. Yeah. yeah. Um, Okay, so um, finalized, justified, um, safe, unsafe, latest, safe to justify it, latest to unsafe. Do we want to cap this all? Is there, yeah. Is there a reason to have unsafe and not just keep latest? I a good point. I, I think, I think the the value of trying to over time rename latest to unsafe helps inform new developers into the ecosystem that they should not be using this thing, um, especially once we have better safes, <laughs> something more close to head than justified. Um, and so I think getting that name change now is the the best opportunity to get the name change. So we're introducing a bunch of other terms, and maybe in you know three to five years we can dep finally deprecate latest. Um, but I do think there's value in making it very clear that you should not be using this unless you really know what you're doing. Okay, so um, I'll just probably submit a PR or update the existing one and we can proceed with that. Okay, and to recap, you will, so finalized and then uh, justified the safe and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. And map, latest. map uh, I guess inside of the consensus layer spec is where we'd probably map. We just do the safe algorithm as returning justified for now. <clears throat> and yeah. then we can update yeah. that algorithm in the future. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it will be probably sometime difficult to um, explain the difference between finalized and justified for end users. I'm not sure if it's going to be. Um, that much useful, but anyway, having the granularity is always good. Um, so, yeah, okay, let's have this all. Also, like a minor question um, is, uh, what should uh, EL respond with uh, when once it get finalized requests uh, before the merge? Um, and I think, yeah, and uh, finalized and justified and safe before the merge. I think it should respond with error, um, which is. Uh, which will allow to avoid uh, any uh, bugs or um, unexpected things happening if, if your request and finalized before the merge and got something uh, meaningful other than error. So um, yeah, I think error is preferable option uh, unless someone has any other opinion. I think the Genesis block is uh, more likely to lead to weird errors. Um, but I, it's not I a strong I, I think I agree. I, I just, I would worry that someone has some sort of setup where they're trying to switch from confirmations to finalized. And then all of a sudden they go from thinking something 10 blocks ago was equivalently finalized to nothing ever in the chain ever being finalized. And I worry about edge cases there. I think an error is yeah, safer. The other option would be for execution clients to have um, some sort of CLI flag they can asked to say, how far back do I want pre-merge finalized to be? So that you can just define finalized to mean latest minus 10 or whatever. You can always do that, but maybe it should be part of the spec. It seems a bit. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, there, there's yeah. software that's deciding if something's finalized, you can maybe use that rather than putting it inside of the client. Okay, so it seems like there's no real objections against an error and it just harmonizes the behavior across everything. Is it possible for uh, JSON RPC clients to find out when the merge 
is going to happen or when it has happened? They can um, they can ask for the difficulty or pre-brando. <laughs> and if that exceeds 64 bits, then the merge is happen. Uh, that value. That's, I think, I'm just the thinking, you can do that right now. I'm thinking of DAP developers who want to um, be merge ready and you want to deploy your app before the merge happens and you want your app to smoothly transition to pre-merge behavior to post-merge behavior with regards to finalized, uh, justified, safe, yada, yada, yada. Uh, I'm trying to think, like, do we have a good story to tell them or a good narrative for how they should build their apps? Like, what, what should they do? You know, should, should they be checking difficulty equals zero? Is that the right thing? Or can we give them like an actual is, is proof of stake versus is proof of work query they can run? And maybe the difficulty thing is perfectly fine. I don't know. Um, they can use this error in response to finalized re finalized requests because oh, uh, no, the merge. Please. Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. No, I know it's like no code flow on errors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree with that. Uh, but um, difficulty zero would mean that uh, the transition is uh, has just started and is in progress. I mean, the first block was difficulty zero. And the merge uh, is finished. It's considered as finished once uh, this first uh, this transition block is finalized. Mm, right, right. So they can't actually so. use finalize until sometime sufficiently after the merge, which is long after difficulty has switched to rando. Right. And I mean, sometime being like twelve minutes or something. Okay. Anything else on, on JSON RPC? Sorry, I had myself muted and I had uh, some closing comments. Um, oh. <laughs> I feel like we should give users a, a, a more clear way to, like a, a reasonable way to find out when it's safe. It's, I don't want to use the word safe, when it's a reasonable time to switch to using finalized um, that doesn't involve them like querying things that are erroring and then having to set up error handling that alters their code flow. Like maybe we can give them a simple JSON RPC method or something they can query that says, is now the time, like is the merge fully complete or um, is finalized available yet or something along those lines. Just adaptive developers don't have to put in these horrible hacks just to build good apps around the merge. Yeah, there might be a good uh, blog post to yeah. once we get some of this stuff in, like yeah. talk about these new tags and also talk about some of the ways they can use them and and maybe some of the logic you can use to kind of assess what the merge happened and that, that kind of stuff. Yeah, and we can definitely organize calls like uh, with application developers and 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 walk them through it and and also just get their concerns about specific flows. Right. If we don't provide and like uh, this graceful uh, method call that will return that the merge has happened, they will have to rely on um, errors um, before the merge and uh, yeah, absence of errors on get finalized block uh, as the signal that the merge has happened. I mean that from JSON RPC, it will not be possible to um, get. Well, I mean you can look at the block which... header, right? You can look um, at the block header and that's what, yeah, cause some stuff will be zero after the merge. Um, that's, that's during the transition. Uh, so you'll, you'll know you're in the transition, but you won't know the merge is complete. And that's when you don't want to switch oh. over your strategy and your app until after the merge is complete. And so right now there's no way right. for, other than just like trying things and getting errors and then like catching the error and changing your behavior based on getting an error. There's no way for an app developer to build something that Changes behavior once the merge is complete. Yeah, I'll call, I'll continue this offline. Are we? Yeah, or we can yeah, create a smart contract which just has the difficulty opcode in it, and then people can just query that smart contract. Yeah, same problem. That, That'll start that returning. Doesn't work uh, during this. Yeah. So you want to know when the first block was finalized, and you cannot query for that. Yeah. Without oh, the first five great. Right. Um, we like we can implement this. This is like a five-line change. 
I just don't really like the notion of having a new uh, a JSON RPC call uh, for like 12 minutes or oh, that that is important for like I don't know maybe maybe like three weeks and then uh, no one's really want to use it uh, no one need needs that anymore we can use it again when we change the consensus engine again hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I'd prefer writing some pseudocode to show how people can decide yeah. this from the, yeah. uh, and, we, and then libraries can write a function if they want, you know, web 3 js Yeah. Cool. But we can take this discussion off. Yeah, we can take this offline. Yeah. OK. Um, next up, I guess, yeah, before we, we move to the next thing, anything else on the merge itself or kill or testing? Uh, next up, uh, Alex has an update about uh, beacon chain withdrawals, and we also have uh, someone else. I'm sorry, I'm I'm searching on the Zoom screens, but there's there already too many people. Um, we had someone from the Lido team who had a proposal for partial withdrawals as well. So uh, maybe Alex, if you want to go first, kind of give an update on 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 what you've been working on, and then uh, we can have uh, yeah. We, yeah, we it's can me. have the partial yeah, control. Yeah. Oh, Archim. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um. Yeah. Alex, do you want to give a quick update, and then we'll go to Archim. Sure. Yeah. So last time we talked about this, uh, essentially, I think there was a lot of uh, sort of demand for something to organize all different threads. Uh, so that turned into a meta spec. I'm just gonna share my screen quickly, and we'll just run through it. It's pretty short. Um, wait a second. That's the wrong one. Sorry. All right. Oh, I see. Can you guys see this? Yes, we can. Yep. Okay. So, yeah, I'm not going to go through this in detail. If you want to read it, it's here. But essentially, it just like, has some pros of like how the withdrawals flow will go and then links to specifications at a high level. The consensus layer uh, essentially schedules when withdrawals should happen and then it puts them into this queue. And then the consensus layer is also in charge of, again, dequeuing withdrawals into execution blocks. Uh, there's a specification for how that works. Uh, at the consensus layer here, uh, there's a PR for the modifications to the engine API because then essentially Again, in some way, the consensus layer dequeues these withdrawals. They're shoved through the engine API to the execution layer. And then what I want to talk about today is essentially two different options here. There's like two different EIPs. Uh, one of them we discussed last time in terms of having a new transaction type to represent the withdrawal. There's another option that is essentially some sort of system level operation uh, that's far more involved. But essentially, it's just saying, okay, rather than having a new 27, 18 uh, style transaction type, we have this new type of thing called an operation, and that's where the withdrawals live. And the reason we want to do that is basically to firewall off, uh, you know, mixing withdrawals from user level transactions. Uh, and there's probably some like safety benefits there. But, uh, and here's the catch, is that one thing we'd really like to have is some sort of logging. So when a withdrawal happens, it'd be really nice if there's some way to just watch the execution layer and know that the withdrawal you know, has actually occurred. Um, and the point here is that if we go with uh, 4863, the previous EIP that we talked about where it's a new transaction type, then uh, you know, we can reuse all the existing sort of events infrastructure, the logging and the EVM, that's great. If we go this other route, 4895, which is, maybe in some sense, you know, cleaner, more elegant. Uh, we, had bas we basically have to recreate all of the receipts infrastructure. And uh, that basically is a lot of work. <laughs> so I essentially want input on this call. Does anyone have any preferences on either route? Have you had time to look at these EIPs? Do you have any feedback? I have a quick question. Is logging yeah. actually very important? So it doesn't have to be. Um, I think it is like pretty nice UX. Uh, 
but yeah, I mean, there's probably other ways to figure out that your withdrawals processed as a validator. And yeah, it's really just a question of like, what, what kind of facilities do we want to provide validators? Right. Um, I have a what's... comment on that. Uh, sorry. Oh, I was going to say, what's the argument against having some way to log this? Let's see. Yeah, wait, yeah much the easier. argument to, uh, to not have them, you asked? Right, right. Like it's complex if we go, I guess, the system operations route to add. Well, logging. right. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, I can just click through. So, basically, like to give you a sketch, like it's literally just having, like, uh, is that important? Okay. Sorry, Zoom's <laughs> been acting very weird today. That's okay. Anyway, like basically, it's just like adding a whole new field to the block. And so, because of that, we can't necessarily directly reuse, uh, you know, the receipts infrastructure that we already have. So we'd have to like duplicate all of that. And that's where it starts to get like quite hairy. Right. Right. And spec right. says that in case of withdrawal operations, it must never fail. It's like unconditional one. So uh, you may basically use um, like these withdrawal operations as logs or a kind of logs. Yeah, I would, I, I'm definitely agree that the logging is like we should Either we go system contract and no logs, or we do something else with logs. I am definitely not a fan of trying to get logging in or get receipts in with the system operations stuff. Right. So does uh, anyone go ahead? Well, first of all, I just wanted to say to Mikhail, I think the spec does not say that it must unconditionally succeed. Um, I think it originally the spec said it. So if you had defined your your is one contract recipient, uh, which is something which would never ever accept anything, um, then you would never be able to withdraw because no matter how much gas you specified, it would still fail. Uh, but I'm kind of so this is option the gasless option... version. This is just like a balance update, right? So that's kind of so both of these options are they both centered around the um, yeah the gasless the, the one where we just do it yeah these are both push good okay that, that <laughs> was my other question we did analysis of existing ox01 deployed contracts none of them rely on code execution and we've spoken with some of the deployers that had logs in there and said they don't need them. yeah Um, I think that uh, the system approach is much cleaner and it's a very important operation. So we, do, we want to do it in a reliable fashion and uh, transaction is just abusing the notion of transaction because it's not really a transaction. It's just a balance update, but it's not like, it's not a, a balanced transfer. And uh, like if we want some logs on the AVM side, uh, things like that, then it should be crafted specifically for this operation because uh, it's, uh, yeah, I wouldn't have used the notion of, of transaction for this. Yeah, which is fine, but then I'd probably suggest going with this option two route. So we build out a new operation thing, uh, but then yeah, just drop the logs. Cause I, I think it's gonna be way too much to like have a whole new like receipts try, have tooling, testing, et cetera, to, to cover all that. Um, but then again, like, do we need access to this from the EVM side? Because if we don't, like, if the observability will be there, you can observe it by the looking at the header and uh, the withdrawals, as was mentioned, they cannot fail, right? So if you see the withdrawals in, 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 in the header, then you, 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 you see all of them. But the question is whether you need uh, this observability from the EVM side as an EVM opcode. Right. And I think I think part of where this came from is we looked at the existing zero uh, sort of ETH1 credentials that have been deployed. And the only real thing anyone was doing was logging. Uh, but yeah, like Danny said, we've talked, I think, to some of the yeah, bigger also, players and it's been fine. Uh, Rocket Pool is really the only one doing the logging. And they said they hadn't actually expected code execution, but just kind of put that in there as the best coding practice. <laughs> so, uh, you know, they're not even necessarily expecting the log. So, um... So as for my five cents, so uh, yeah, and, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not really up to speed on all the details, but um, I agree that uh, putting them as transaction is abusing transaction, the concept of transactions. 
However, block body is now a list of, of uh, uncles. It's going to be empty list of uncles uh, after the merge, and it's a list of transactions. And there is a lot of code out there that um, fetches bodies based on this, uh, an ETH protocol, which have the capacity to request these pieces of information from another peer. If we want to add a third aspect to the block body, I think that might be a lot of uh, work that um, a lot of code that needs to be rewritten. Uh, I would like to have heard if Felix or Peter have any thoughts about this. I don't know if they're on the call though. I don't see them on the call. No. So the, the two options for where to put these system transactions on block, I think right now are just append to the end <clears throat> or take over uncles. Previously, Peter had argued pretty strongly against taking over uncles and he strongly prefers mm. um, appending new things to the end and just mm. throwing away, like accepting the cost of the extra bytes. Uh, yeah, will there be a lot of process. withdrawals? Can we simply put them in the header rather than the block body? We can bound are them be a to lot of them. a fixed amount per slot, and the, and they will be. So we could decide on a number. And, you know, it affects kind of some of the UX here. Uh, but the exit queue is already bound to approximately four ish per slot. Um, so after you clear out, you know, maybe some large amount of withdrawals at the beginning, uh, the bound doesn't need to be much more than that. And the, and the consensus layer will have a bound on what how much is putting in here because there will be you know a maximum cost of this operation on the system, um, and that number can be to, depending on. Hmm. Yeah, so it seems, and, and and please correct me if I'm wrong here. We it seems like we have rough consensus around the system level operations approach, and it's like a question of how rather than like if um does that generally make sense yeah and, and no logging right and no logging and i think so i alex i don't know i i think the ether scan people had said they were fine with like either option as well like i think the one yeah. thing we want to make sure if there's no logging is yeah that folks who monitor this stuff are still able to to access it and, and expose it um, right, and if you're going block by block, like the the withdrawal will be there, and we know that it right. succeeds. So, right. yeah, the, okay. the, I think the one use case you don't really get is like I'm a validator, I turn on my node, and I just want to, I have, I know my withdrawal index, and I want to ask if it happened or not, you know, where it happened, efficiently. Right. Otherwise, yeah, you can scan. I mean, and, and they're sequential, so you can you can do a binary search. Uh, to find where your where your receipt happened, or actually, yeah, you can actually know if your receipt happened very quickly, because you can look at the latest withdrawal, um, and if it's greater than your receipt index, and it has happened. Um, so there's there's there are things there you can do without logs to probably handle most of the use cases we care about outside of the EVM. Okay, uh, and Scar, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just basically wanted to ask, and um, once maybe this answer the document, but for potentially putting the full withdrawal into the header, like what's the size of, of, of a withdrawal? Is it just the two address and the amount, or is there anything else? Because then it's basically barely bigger than just putting the hash in there, right? It's an, it's an address, it's an amount, and currently an index. And what's the index used for on the execution on the side? To Honestly, differentiate. It's, yeah, it's to differentiate. It's when we were going with the transaction method uh, and any sort of logging and that kind of stuff. It allows you to differentiate. Um, it also would allow you to do you know a search like I just talked about uh, more easily because um, it's not necessarily oh, amount okay. amount and address are not necessarily unique um, given partial withdrawals. Yeah, but then that still seems only 2x the uh, basic size of just the hash, right? So maybe it's just the easiest to maybe put the full thing in the header. But you would have more than one per block. 
I guess, okay, in, in, in terms of next step, does it make sense to move uh, the, the system level version, so 4895 to consider for inclusion and, and have people kind of keep obviously looking into that and, and uh, kind of figuring out the quirks around it, but just so, uh, yeah, we can make sure we're, we're kind of all focused on the same thing. Sounds good to me. Yeah, I guess, yeah, does anyone have an, an objection to that? Nope. Okay. Um. On the on the partial withdrawals, I, I just want to say, yeah, I have this tracking issue on the consensus layer. Um, there are three key features here. One is to fully withdraw exit validators. The other is to change credentials from VLS credentials to uh, execution layer credentials, such that you can perform withdrawals. And the third is a, a partial withdrawal option, um, which I'm working on in a peer right now. Uh, I think that this is one from the from the perspective of the execution layer. Uh, all of them just look like things being withdrawals being dequeued de into the uh, execution layer, and so that that complexity doesn't really matter. But from the perspective of uh, validators and and features, I think it's a pretty critical feature um, to not put crazy pressure on validators exiting and validator return. So it is, it is, and has been kind of in the, the consensus layer roadmap. Right, and uh, Artyom, do you want to take maybe a minute to kind of explain what your proposal was? Uh, yeah, it's kind of obsolete now. Like uh, the new push-based proposal is uh, definitely more preferable from the point of view of liquid staking protocol as well. Yeah, I just like to know that uh, Partial withdrawals are crucial for us. Yeah, and um, yeah. no. I think for even just for many other use cases as well, they're pretty critical to the, the experience. And yeah, just for the health of the beacon chain, you don't want people having to withdraw their like 33. That's something east to then just right. redeposit it on the other side. Um, yeah. And yeah. we've uh, got a second part of our proposal, which is more related to the question of how to pass some intentions from execution layer to the consensus layer. Like when a validator would like to rotate its keys or do a forced exit, but it's out of the scope for this call. Right, this seems like more of a consensus layer call type discussion. Yeah, and I, yeah, I'm happy to, uh, I haven't had a chance to read the proposal, but I do think that that is a very nice feature and actually protects against a couple of like weird withholding attacks that we should talk about. Cool. Anything else on, on withdrawals? And so, sorry, and the maximum is four or 40 per, per four. block? Uh, four is the amount number of exits per slot currently. Um, and so the number of withdrawals per slot you would probably have in that same order. Uh, it depends on the partial withdrawal scheme, but I would say four to 16 are the, the realm of what we do here. There's no execution block in a slot. Do those withdrawals designated for that slot get moved to the next one? So you have eight in the following? Not currently, no. Okay. That would put a you know unbound cost on yeah. the execution layer with respect to this. But uh, if it's only per, four, per not empty slot. Yeah. If it's only four or even sixteen, maybe we can put them in, in, into the header. Um, but if, if you foresee that in the future it will be more than maybe to be future proof, then we, yeah, it should be better to be, to be in the body. Right. Yeah. And we, yeah, I think we can take that offline as we're, we're looking into the implementation details. Um, yeah. Anything else on, on withdrawals? Uh, I could also say that there, uh, from the point of view of uh, staking protocol, 
there might be a slight desire to be able to distinguish partial and uh, full withdrawals, like maybe different addresses, but it seems to be too difficult to implement and not, not very crucial for, for, for us. But just to note. Right. Yeah, I mean, with the beacon root opcode, all of that becomes possible. Um, it's a matter of that existing or not. Um, okay, yeah, just to move on, because we only have 20 minutes and at least one big topic left. Uh, Frodo, you had an update on EIP 4844, never pronounced that right, uh, for, the, for the shard blob transactions. Um, exactly. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I'll through? give you a very quick update. So since last Alcor devs call, we have worked on consensus specs, execution APIs, we have built a, a meta spec to link everything together. I think that relates to the proposal Tim is uh, going to share, where we're trying to find a structure for this cross-layer EIP process. For now, we'll just try and work with every specs repository out there. We also have execution APIs now, and we have benchmarks as well as implementer nodes. Uh, the benchmarks are very recent. I'm not sure if everyone had the time to look at those yet. But it boils down to having to batch verify these blob transactions to work around the uh, the processing time issues. Um, so this requires some minor refactoring to take multiple transactions and verify them together. And then the blobs within a transaction can also be batch verified. Um, all in all, I think it's not too bad. And the same applies here to the consensus layer that can also batch verify blobs. And uh, we're working on uh, testing with Prism and working on tooling to, to try and get the DevNet uh, running. Nice. So uh, if you have an TLDR on uh, how, so say uh, someone sends me a, a that's a 1,000 blob transactions. Every single one of them is valid, but they're constructed to be as hard to as possible to verify. What well, so, well, well, park we're talking about then? Well, if you receive all those transactions from the same pair, you can batch verify them. And then if everything is invalid, you can start scoring down the pair. If one of them is valid and you need that one transaction to go through, then you have more of a hairy situation because once you figure out that the batch is invalid, you'll have to go and bisect the, the thing to find the valid uh, block transactions. In the end, the 3D, you, you want to like penalize pairs that are giving you this bad information in the first place. Like this is like provably bad. So you like it's objective. Um, and it doesn't affect consensus. Like this is in the transaction pool. Like this is the step before that. So I think we need to improve the the peer scoring system in the execution layer to help yeah. filter out things when things do go wrong. Uh, I can speak for all clients. Yes, do not do peer scoring. There's no such concept. The consensus layer has extensive peer scoring. And it really does help avoid problems with like bad attestations or these other high throughput things. What about the UDM yeah. pairs, right? So we don't even ban pairs, no. I mean, node IDs are uh, free. So there's no point to ban pairs. Um, we do kind of have some IP limits, uh, but yeah. We don't spend a lot of time scoring pairs. We kick out the pair if it does something bad. But node That's IDs right. are free. I understand. So I guess the point is you can get a thousand of these transactions from somebody, but on the first, you're going to stop processing. I mean, I can spin up a thousand node IDs 
uh, connect them to a guy and send him a thousand transactions from different identities uh, for free. Uh, well, there is some processing power because we need to generate these transactions uh, at some point, but then I can reuse them. Um, and if we're, I mean, the, the guy, people that I send them to will not remember them indefinitely uh, if I have enough of them. Uh, so I could just spam the network with them. Uh, and what I'm curious about is, yeah, how, how costly it is to avoid the attack. So a single batch of blobs is somewhere between 50 and 70 milliseconds to verify. Um, this batch can be very large. Um, I'd say at like the 40 or 50-ish milliseconds is for like a single transaction. Like the batch versus a regular like single transaction is it's not that different. Uh, so batching is important here, where we like avoid cost overhead of adding a lot more to verify. In the end, like it is processing, and we should just like use that information that if you're getting something that's wrong, to try and ignore more of that before we get the denial of service. Um, um, well, how would that look? I mean, uh, no different than um, current transactions. So, like, oh, sorry, if current I mean, transactions are invalid, you all also ignore them, and hopefully, like, you cannot deny, you cannot dos a gaff node, but just keep by keeping <laughs> this these lower, these smaller transactions up. Like it doesn't matter if you send like a thousand small transactions or like one large transaction if the verification is not does not like if the pair that sends you those is not held accountable. We do need some system to give feedback to what is being received. Right, but the, the like the only tool that is that we can trust is that if someone sends me something, then I can disconnect from him. That is the only guarantee we have. There is no guarantee that you can rely on a scoring or ban to be effective. Right. And you're saying node IDs are free, but IPs aren't quite as free. Yes. <clears throat> um, and yeah, so it might be possible to ban IPs, uh, but that's uh can be tricky it seems to work for eve too like the whole pair scoring system i think it's not too difficult to emulate some of that small subset enough to but say it, like if transaction is invalid we should consider this pair as as bad and prioritize others mm. yeah with it i mean and i guess they do have peer scoring it's it's just a kick you know, that's binary. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is binary too. If the, a transaction is invalid, that's all because of the pair that's sending you the transaction. It's very clear that they're misbehaving. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just don't really see, yeah. Okay, we don't have to go too deep into this actually on this call. Um, I'll read up on the benchmarks and, and specs and stuff. Yeah, and, and Scar, you have to. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Proto. Then and Scar. The agenda, as well as the meta spec links, the benchmarks, and these optimizations. Right. And what I was going to say is just that I think it's at least worth considering as well that uh, there's no necessity to have a mempool, mempool support for these transactions right, right at the time they put the mainnet. So basically this would not necessarily have to be a binding constraint from bringing it to mainnet. We could launch without support and then for one, of course, it will be a slow wrap up for Rob's using those and it's fine for me at the beginning to just only, because of course nodes would support having that locally fed to the mempool. So like he, he, they could just run their own staking nodes or they could cooperate or they could create an op. Uh, like a separate P2P network for that. Like basically, it's fine if we only add that support to mempool later. Of course, it's not ideal, but so this is not necessarily like constrained to the, to the time window. Right. 
Uh, Andrew, you also had your hand up, and I think we can down and start it back up. So, do you have any comments you wanted to make? Okay. Uh, anyone else have comments, thoughts on 4844? Um, I do think that benchmarks from a number of or stress tests from a number of different places are probably pretty important. Um, you know, just the consensus layer decrypting one to two megabyte blocks, uh, you know, and then passing the execution layer. There's just you know, going from 20 kilobyte blocks to 90, uh, as we are with the merge. I don't expect things to burst the steams, but I do. I do think that it's not unlikely that once we get to one megabyte that like little things we didn't expect um, start to operate in different ways that we are unexpected in bad ways. Um, I don't think any of this is going to be intractable, solvably, but um, I think that it's good to investigate something. Sweet. Anything else? Okay. Um, last on the agenda, I had something. So uh, we discussed this, uh, I think, on the last call, uh, if not on the Discord shortly after. Um, basically, uh, the, the, the core EIP process is kind of reaching its limits with uh, the, the merge where we have a completely different process on the beacon chain than, than on, on mainnet. Um, and we are starting to have proposals which uh, clearly span across both. So the two things we, we talked today are, are talked about today are, are good examples of that. Um, so it's quite hard to like reason about like what the entire spec for something should be and 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 how the different parts all work together. Um, and in parallel, uh, there are folks working on an executable spec for the execution layer, um, which aims to kind of over time uh, complement or replace the yellow paper as a, as a canonical spec for Ethereum. Um, so I had a, a proposal that uh, yeah, I put together about how we could harmonize all of this, um, just shared it in the chat. At a very high level, the idea is that uh, we would keep core EIPs as the way to like describe changes, provide the motivation, the rationale, uh, list security considerations, and also just have like a EIP number that's easy to reference within the community. Um, use these for both consensus layer and execution layer changes. Um, but then over time, basically move the implementation sections to the execution specifications rather than having them live directly in, in the EIP itself. Um, and so that, you know, the benefit we get there is that uh, A, it's like harmonized across the beacon chain and the execution layer. B, uh, you can link both. So if you have an EIP like beacon chain withdrawals, uh, you can just say, hey, here's the change to the execution spec, here's the change to consensus specs, and maybe even the API repositories. And then C, uh, there's always been like this big uh, concern with like the, we, we don't have a lot of EIP editors. Uh, so we, we want it to be easy for them to actually review EIPs. And one of the one of the things that's actually quite hard for them to review is, is when people put links in the EIPs because uh, there's a bunch of dead links over time. It's hard to assess the quality. Um, so by having links out to just the different specs repo, um, you can have a pretty easy to enforce rule that's like you only allow links to you know, these two or three repositories um, and, 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 and just blocking the IP if it has a link elsewhere. Um, and then if you know, the EIP author wants to add a whole bunch of links as part of their PR to the, to the specs repo, then they can do that. Um, but it's not, it's not like blocked in the EIP process. Um, I know Greg, you had some comments um, uh, about this. Is Greg still on the call? Um, yes, yes. So yeah, Greg, you had some comments about this. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let you share them. I also put together an ETH Magicians link uh, for people to discuss. Um, but yeah, yeah, Greg. A lot of this we'll just need to discuss as editors. We've only got about seven minutes left, so I don't think we can dig very deep. Um, there's some good ideas there, but 
I think it's a lot more intrusion on the EIP process than we want to see. And in some ways it's making it harder. Um, the whole point of the executable spec is that it is another client. So in the usual process, the clients often with the help of the EIP author implement the EIP. And the beauty of the executable spec is that once that client is running and is on the main net and in consensus, that client becomes the reference. So I, I actually don't expect that a core IP, EIP could be a totally complete and accurate reference when it's done. The, the network itself is ground truth. And so having one client that we can point to and say, we intend for that to be the actual reference is great. Um, but whether we try to pull that back into the EIP as a diff against a particular um, implementation doesn't, doesn't really seem to help matters. I don't think that's where the bottleneck is. And I don't think the issue of references is really directly related. That that's a different discussion we're having. And I disagree on that one too. But <laughs> fair enough. And um, Danny, you also have your, your hand up? Yeah. So just a quick follow-up on that, and then I have a, a quick comment. Um, on the consensus layer, it isn't a full client. It is actually um, you know, implementation of, of, of core state transition logic such in, in very uh, non-optimized ways, in ways that uh, just expose what the logic should be rather than uh, the sophistication of the logic as it will be in a client. And so it, it can't run on mainnet. It also doesn't have networking interfaces and other things. Yeah. Like that. So, so yeah. The, the, and, and then we can build test vectors of it. So I, I just, it, there's, there's a different, there's a spectrum of what you can do with it. Um, and I, I just wanted to, to say that out loud. And then, but I will say, I don't know if this helps our EIP editor problem. I mean, it, it just shifts the burden to a different highly specialized group. Um, you know, on the consensus layer, there's a handful of people that have the ability to review these types of specs and provide rich dynamic feedback. And sometimes uh, there are PRs that are open for a very long time because uh, it's hard to take the time to, to dig into it. So I, I it maybe is useful in getting more people at the table, but I don't know if it like solves the EIP editor problem. I do think it maybe solves other types of problems though. I, I think it makes it harder for editors. I can't. We have to become experts in yet another thing. To be clear, right, yeah. It's not expected that the editors would have to review the executable spec as Ooh. well. Like I think like, so like Danny said, you do have different people who then review the actual spec and like they might oh. be the same humans but you don't impose that so you don't impose basically like a technical review of the executable spec before merging the eip itself yeah so so eip editors would only be responsible for ensuring that the format is correct that like like the the tooling says the right things but the actual review of the content of the diff would be probably by you know uh core devs right so I yeah. guess I don't see how this helps. I mean, there isn't being a huge overlap too. Like if I, I would have a hard time reading a meta spec and being like, okay, this sounds fine. I'm not going to go look at the code that rep, that actually has all the logic. Mm -hmm. I just I'd... take a look at the WASM spec. It's entirely declarative way back in an appendix. There's an algorithm and they make clear the algorithm's not the spec. It's an example. The spec is totally declarative. It, it's up to you how to implement it. Um, so there's, it's just not clear that this language is going to be the best way to actually say, this is what I want to do. Um, so to ask someone with an idea to improve the protocol to say, oh, but first you have to figure out how to say it in this specialized language that may or may not be the best way to express your idea. Um, you know, a paragraph of English can turn into a page or two of code um, when the English was totally clear to anyone who knew how to write the code. Yeah, so Martin, you had, 
your hand up. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Sam. And then no, I was going to say, I think, I think that's a fair criticism. I mean, I think um, one of the, the, it's kind of a trade off, right? Like a lot of things will be easier to express without having to describe the current state. So that, that's a problem that comes up in EIPs a lot today is that to say how you're changing something, you first have to have to define how that something works. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the, this code diff process will improve that part of it. But you're right, there are some changes that are going to be way easier to describe as English um, that you'll have to implement as Python if, if we go down this road. So. Yeah, I, mean, I know oh. just enough Python to hack a script together um, or to to read fairly simple descriptions of structures and stuff. But um, yeah, and if you do take a look at the consensus layer specs, that's that is the requisite knowledge. Um, and it doesn't yeah. use anything Pythonic and it uh, does not compose things in, in weird ways and is pretty much and doesn't mm -hmm. use even like complex uh, not even complex, but just Pythonic type construction such that you you know you have for loops, you have variable assignments, and you have mm. very simple data structures. Um, again, I I I think there's a, I'm not trying to make a claim one way or the other on on the best way to do this. Yeah, I'd rather see the the EIP process close out, and then this 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 executable spec is its own thing, um, and I get there'll have to be some way of vectoring over but trying to do both in one process i think will only make it harder um and, i mean when i put in code for instance um that code is often going to be uh go not python because i might have implemented the algorithm in gaff and then i can put in code i've actually tested um and translating the code to Python isn't that hard for the core group uh, that's doing it, but it's hard for me. Um, now, if if we want to pull that text back into the EIP at the end of the process, that's not too hard. Um, yeah. Or if someone who knows that stuff wants to become a co-author, um, that's fine too, but. Yeah, Martin, you were about to say something. Um, yeah, well, initially I was going to say the same thing that Dana said originally, that doesn't need to be a full blown, uh, you know, a network machine that can live on mainnet. But then I want to say that, you know, I've spent quite a lot of time uh, reviewing um, EAPS and also implementing EAPS. And, <laughs> The, the English language is great, but when you translate the English language into actual code, when you that's when you find all the corner cases and things that mm -hmm. were implicit in the English language. And when you put it into code, it needs to you need to make it explicit, and that's when you find the, the quirks and the corner cases, uh, which shows that this specification was underspecified; it was too vague. So I think it's good if we get closer to how it looks on the e 2 side where it is code, where the author who put this down was actually forced to figure all these things out. And anyone who actually implements it can, can basically post his implementation against the reference implementation uh, or just transpile it into his language. So I think that lowers the, the lowers the amount of work needed to be done at five different client implementers, um, since the work of you know putting it down into code is only done once in the in the like translation from English to code is only done once by the author or someone else. Did. So I think it's it's good to move in that direction, uh, but there's yeah. a spectrum. Yeah, that's well, they, about it they do get implemented the translation they get implemented they get translated however whoever's writing it might find it easier to read the english might find it right easier to read but the it's kind of like the way it is yeah. now whoever implements it first uh does one implement one interpretation and thinks yeah that's obvious that it must be and then mm -hmm. someone else does another interpretation implements it slightly different because you know 
Yeah. It would be. So I think it's nicer. Yeah. One of we the have just web thing code today, which, which is heavily. I'm just, uh, yeah, sorry. I'm just saying if, if I have an EIP, I've completely implemented it in Go or C in a client. And then it's like, well, that's all very well and good, but it's not an acceptable EIP until you translate it to Python. And it's like, but um, it's expressed here in Go, and the Go works. Do you want me to translate it to something else that I can't actually run and test? Um, no. <laughs> but I guess what Martin is saying is, if I understand correctly, is that's not the case for like the median EIP. The median EIP is like basically underspecified in the current format because, yes. yeah. And, yeah. And, and so this spec kind of forces you to at least fully specify it and or, 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 or realize that you can't and that you need to do some more work basically, yeah. Yeah, I'm just saying that happens in the process by the time by the time something gets accepted, it, it will have been implemented in more than one client. Um, we will have found these cases. The authors generally aren't in a position to do all of that implementing and testing anyway. So the question gets more at the tail end when it's actually working, how best to express that. And currently, slowly the EIPs make it into the yellow paper and the yellow paper is, is the, the canonical spec. Um, and we can change that, but trying to get the authors to write canonically up front is going to be hard. It, you're going to need an expert to work with the author to do that. And I think that's just going to be even harder to find that person. But if such a person stands up and volunteers, yes. We're already uh, five minutes over time, so we can yep. continue this on East Magicians. So I, I shared the link, it's, it's in the agenda. Yes, and thank Greg, you. I pasted all your comments from the agenda in the East Magicians oh, thread. Um, <laughs> anyone have anything else they wanted to, to share before we, we head out? Yeah, to echo what Light Client said, you can run the full Python implementation for the consensus layer side. And I think very importantly, the tests that you write for that implementation, for that Python spec, actually become the consensus tests. And so when we have people build new features, they also write tests and those actually become the reference tests. Uh, whereas I think when we have many different clients implementing EIPs, um, we don't always capture all of the edge cases and reference tests, uh, even though even when we're kind of like cross-testing our implementations and stuff. So it's just another another component of, of this process that can be useful. Right. Thanks, sir. Yeah, highlighting that. Anything else before we wrap up? Okay. I, I think, yeah, worth noting, I think Europeans, your time will shift before the next Alcor devs. Uh, we are not shifting the Alcor devs time, so it'll be at a different local time for you. If you live somewhere where daylight savings time is a thing. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for coming on. Thanks to everybody who didn't drop off halfway through after the merge stuff. Um, and I'll see you all in two weeks. Thank see you, Jim. Nice Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, everyone. everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.